My name is Carla Nestor, and I'm an adult and pediatric nephrologist, and I'm actually at the University of Iowa. I work particularly in the Stead Family Children's Hospital as a pediatric nephrologist and a rare uh, renal disease specialist. So um, I've been in the complement field essentially my entire career. My fellowship was in the glomerular diseases, but then shortly after my fellowship, I joined the University of Iowa, which of course is a is a, one of those uh, centers for the study of complement and human diseases. So it is an ultra rare kidney disease. So you, we think of it generally as still being only about three to five patients per million. So I always joke in the state of Iowa, we're 3.2 million. We probably only have nine patients in the entire state. But uh, the point is ultra rare disease. It classically affects young, children and young adults. So we're talking uh, in most of the cohorts that have been reported, the median age is a 16 year old, for instance. So we're talking young people. The scary part of that is, is that 50% of those will go to end stage within 10 years of diagnosis. So when you think about it, if you've got that 12 or 16 year old who is going to go to end stage, they're going to require kidney transplant early in their life. And the unfortunate truth about that is, is up until this point, transplant recurrence was incredibly common. And so therefore, even loss of the transplant was also common. So you can see that the burden of disease for that average patient group, you know, then you add, you know, this is a young group of people that are in the midst of their lives, right? They're either in high school, or they're getting their first job, or they're progressing to building families, etc. So it's quite the burden on that group of patients. And I will say up to this point, we haven't had a reliable approach to treating them. So the outcome has still been presumed to be 50% at end stage in 10 years. So um, it's a pretty dismal diagnosis for the average patient to get. So what we know from animal models uh, and what we can tell from the biomarkers of humans is, is that this is a disease of the alternative pathway of complement. So um, this means, uh, you know, the alternative pathway of the complement system is part of your innate immunity. It's, it's an incredibly important part of your, of your immune system. And it's natural. It's just uh, you know, again, part of your intrinsic self, if you will. What happens in this group of patients, either from a genetic abnormality, now that's the minority, but up, maybe up to 20%, or an autoimmune protein, they develop dysregulation of the alternative pathway. So essentially what happens is you turn the pathway on, it doesn't shut off the way it's supposed to. Let's say it gets turned on naturally from an infection, et cetera. It doesn't shut off like it's supposed to. And so what it does is this constant churning of the pathway creates breakdown products of the complement system. And those breakdown products end up on the kidney and between the local complement activity that's already dysregulated and then all of those breakdown products, we get considerable damage to the kidney. And then therefore, that's the eventual uh, cause of the end stage, if you will. So again, underlying disease is alternative pathway dysregulation. Now, if you think about Fabhalta, uh, a factor B inhibitor, factor B is critical to the activity of the alternative pathway. So if you block factor B, then you block the alternative pathway. So for instance, patients who have a very low C3 because they're constantly churning it over, their liver is making the right amount of C3, they're just chewing it up and putting it on their kidney. If you block factor B, you can stop that process. And in fact, uh, that's the exciting part about uh, alternative pathway blockade is, is that you can if, functionally stop the progress of this disease. The phase three trial was a six month placebo controlled trial, randomized controlled trial, so that uh, patients were either randomized to placebo or they were randomized to the factor B inhibitor. Um, the primary endpoint was uh, proteinuria, and, and that's uh, uh, from a physician standpoint, the degree of proteinuria for us predicts risk, if you will, to loss of kidney function. So you have a six month placebo-controlled, randomized placebo-controlled trial. Um, and 
the patients were followed for that six months. And then, of course, uh, that was the, the point at which uh, the regulatory agency would have seen, seen that data to actually approve or not approve FabHalta. They were also, by the way, followed up for an additional six months. And I believe they're actually being followed even to this day. At the end of that six month, what we knew or what we found out about FabHalta is, is, is two important things. Well, first of all, the most important thing for a regulatory agency is it met its primary endpoint. So uh, 35 uh, percent plus of those patients in the FabHalta arm. In fact, they reduced their urine protein by 35 percent, the people in the, the FabHalta group, as opposed to the people in the placebo group uh, did not reduce their urine protein. They actually had uh, some uh, worsening, if you will, of the urine protein. So um, that right there would have predicted that those patients were on that track to loss of kidney function. But then one of their other endpoints um, was the stabilization of the GFR. And so um, depending on which cohort uh, you use as your background, uh, again, if you think about loss of kidney function by the 10th year, then you already know that these patients are yearly losing milliliters of GFR, if, if you will. So um, what they found out in the FabHalta treated group is, is that they had a substantial improvement in that slope. So a slope that was going down quite nicely as if they were going to go to end stage um, at 10 years, then suddenly became a flat slope and even a slight up tip, if you will, in that GFR slope. So that um, not only do we now have the, the proof that FabHalta can actually reduce the, the urine protein in those patients, if you will, but also we have the concept that um, you can stabilize the GFR, which from a clinician standpoint, that's satisfying to me because now we think that these patients are not going to progress to ESKD like they would have without treatment. Yeah, so the take home is obviously uh, for the first time in ever. And again, I, I stated that I've essentially been in the complement world for, for a decent chunk of time. But let's say I've been practicing uh, nephrology for almost 18 years. For the first time in my 18 years, we actually have a therapeutic that is targeted for this group of patients. I didn't mention yet that the standard of care, which includes uh, two fine drugs, mycophenolate, mofetil, and steroids, uh, but they have significant side effects, and I'm primarily referring to the steroids, but um, they were not uh, routinely effective. In fact, uh, it seemed like, uh, you know, much less than 30% of patients were even getting partial response to those agents. So now for the first time in forever, we have a targeted therapeutic. Of course, we need, need real world time to know exactly what it's going to look like. But from, from my clinician viewpoint, this means that these patients are not going to progress. Or if they do progress, it's going to be in so much slower so that they're going to live their younger lives without quite the same burden of disease that they would have had prior to this approval. You know, this will occur to some of your clinicians is, is that are these drugs safe? And I think I, you know, I can refer, you know, the, the people who read about this from you are that, uh, or hear this, um, we didn't always know that they were going to be safe, but now we have data that suggests that they are. Uh, it turns out you can block the alternative pathway with FabHalta, and these patients actually do quite well. They don't have excess infections. So um, that's one thing. So I think that we are discovering that these, that these agents are safe. The second thing is, is that it's going to allow them to be spared, if you will, from the those other agents that were actually uh, had potential significant side effects. And where I'm talking about is steroids. Um, it may very well be that moving forward, we can find that this agent can be used as monotherapy and that patients won't be exposed to quite the same degree of, of uh, the other nonspecific immune suppressants that we were, you know, rather incessantly doing in the past.